Hi there and welcome to this editing video. Um, so today I'm going to go through the specific settings in the presets that I use and what those settings are, why I've chosen those particular settings for um, saving and for editing my photos in Lightroom. If you saw my previous video, that um, was when I shared a quick edit, which is usually what I'm doing with each photo after a session. When I import it to Lightroom, I am applying this preset and then I don't have to tweak it much. I've pretty much um, built this preset to be something that applies well in most lighting circumstances. Um, but today I wanted to just spend more detail looking at what exactly those are. And hopefully in looking at what those settings are, it will also help you understand Lightroom a little bit better if you are new to the game. Um, so I have this photo pulled up in my library module right now, which is right up here along the top. This is from an elopement that I photographed a few months ago, but I thought it would be a good photo for this video choice because um, it just has very typical lighting for what I like to shoot, which is that um, things are pretty diffused. There aren't really any harsh light, but also their faces are pretty well lit. Um, I'm primarily a wedding photographer too, and so most of the work that I am photographing is involving couples in cozy situations like this, so I feel like it's pretty representative of what I'm doing most of the time. Um, so there are settings over here in the quick develop module, which I don't typically use, but um, if you're just going in and going to a photo right off the bat, this will allow you to make things warmer if you decide to do so. Um, you can also make things have a little bit different tint, so it might be more red or more green the opposite direction. So these allow you to just kind of apply some really quick tweaks, which sometimes can be really helpful as you're going through photos if you have like a series of images that are all a little bit dark. This helps you just just edit them really quickly so that you can kind of skim through them to see um, what the bulk of the image looks like and then save yourself that time so you don't have to edit every single picture. You can just choose the ones that are the best. Um, you can also apply presets from here. I typically don't. I usually just go right into this develop module to do all of my editing. Um, so. First things first, I apply the preset right off the bat. Um, I just think that is the easiest way for things to handle. Um, I have a lot of presets over here on the left hand side. Um, the one that I use most frequently is Rachel, which is actually the preset that I designated for this couple's elopement. Um, so this preset, as you can see, it applies a little bit dark um, depending on certain settings, but that is typically the way that I like to begin my editing process. I like to see highlights that are not blown out um, and typically I shoot a little bit dark anyway. So this just helps me bring out that contrast in the images and that's what I like to do. Um, all of my presets, or almost all of them I suppose, I name them after the clients that I tweak them for. Right now this is the one that I've been using most of the time, which really means nothing other than that it is my current obsession. Um, I'm going to go ahead and minimize this panel just so it's a little bit less distracting. So there are a few things that are important to look at now that we have this view up. Um, over here in the history panel, it will show you all of the edits that you have done so far to this photo. So if I think back to when I liked the photo when it was really magenta in that library quick develop module that we looked at, I can just click on it and it will bring it back for me. And I can also move back to where I just was. So it's really helpful um, if you're starting to wonder like, uh oh, I think I did something wrong and I want to move back where I was. You don't have to hit command Z a bunch of times, you can just go ahead and click and that's it. So I wanted to go through all the settings over here on the right hand panel too. This thing right at the top is called the histogram and what it is showing you is the prevalence of really dark or really light tones in the image. Um, so things over here are going to be really light which is why this is called the white section. These are highlights. Um, this is the actual exposure like the mid tone of the photo too. The shadows and the black areas. And you can adjust things from here a little bit. I typically don't. Um, because we can use these exact same settings right down here in this panel. But this can be helpful to look at because it's showing us that there is a lot of darkness in the shadows and there's like not so much of these mid-tones and we have really no whites and highlights. So this is just telling me that the image is too dark, which I can already see right here. Sometimes it reads wrong. So if you have an image where things are really, really backlit, so there's a lot of white behind the people and their faces might be a little dark, then your histogram might look really crazy high over here and a little bit over here and not have much in between. That doesn't mean anything is wrong with the way that the photo is actually exposed. It's just reading data, basically. It can't actually see the image and it's not actually telling you what's going on. Um, the numbers under this are also a little bit helpful. These are your settings when you were taking the picture in the first place. I was at ISO 100, which is typically what I'm using for really bright situations. 
I was using my 50 millimeter lens. My aperture was set to f1.8, which means that my background is pretty blurry um, and also that it is letting in a lot of light. And my shutter speed is at 1 1,250th of a second. So um, there are different settings here in this panel that I will come back to last, actually. I like to mess with those at the very end. But I like to start off in this basic panel here. So first of all, um, it gives you different color profile options. I usually don't change mine, um, but that's just Adobe standard. I just work with a standard color profile. But there are others where it has other default settings for how it reads colors from your camera. Um, and so you might be set to Adobe Vivid or you might do Adobe Landscape. I just prefer Adobe Standard. I don't really use the others. It's going to be the most true colors for what was actually shot. Um, so first and foremost, we'll come back to white balance in just a moment. I like to get things exposed properly first so whether they're the proper brightness and then I can really tell what I'm working with. Um, things right now are pretty dark so I'm going to go ahead and bring this exposure up. And I really like to see an image that is going to like bring out these highlights. It's going to remain um, pretty well exposed for their skin. I'm typically exposing for people's faces. That's the focalizing point of the image for me, and I think that that should be properly exposed here. Um, so I'm pretty happy with this at 1.3, which as you can see makes a really big difference. Now we can actually see her face, <laughs> and we can see his face a little bit better too. Um, and her dress has been brightened up too. So you may have seen, I'll go ahead and undo it and then bring it back again. Watch how much the histogram changes in the top right. So all of those shadows that were over here before are now in mid-tone. And that's about where I want them because we see that this gray wall is just a lot more neutral and middle ground than it was before. I like to see that and that's just a visualization of how things have changed um, throughout the whole exposure of the image. Um, I'm pretty happy with the contrast. I usually don't change this setting very much. I do have a variation of this um, preset that has less contrast um, just because sometimes if the light is really bright it might seem like the blacks are too dark and the whites are too bright at the same time. Um, so you can see if you add more contrast things really start to look kind of like picnic filtery if you use that back in the day like I did um, or no contrast whatsoever. So depending on the look that you're going for and depending on the lighting that you have, it may be important to sometimes have less contrast or even to add a little bit more. I'm pretty happy with it at zero right now for this photo. Okay, and these next four settings are the ones that were also tied up here in the histogram with the blacks and shadows and your highlights and whites. So in this image, um, this highlight slider, if you drag it up, is going to make all of the light areas even lighter. Um, I am fairly happy with where it's at. Even though her dress um, is not bright, bright white, I like for it to maintain a little bit of like these shadows because I like to see the depth. I don't want it to be totally washed out. That's really important on a wedding day, um, especially for if you have some dresses that have like really interesting detail, like hers has some ruching around the hips that are a little bit harder to see in this photo. But I like to preserve the details of what makes those dresses really interesting because no one wants to see their wedding dress and realize that the whole thing is just like blown out white and then they can't even see what their wedding dress looks like. So I like to make sure that I'm preserving those details in the highlights. Um, that's equally important for shooting outdoors when you're thinking about the sky. That will help you preserve detail in the clouds um, and things like that too. The shadow slider is really similar, but it's for these darker areas like here in his suit jacket. So if we bring up our shadow slider all the way, it's going to make his jacket a lot lighter. Um, but also if you bring it down, it's just really going to turn those into straight black. And I like the default setting because once again, I've built this preset to work pretty well in all the circumstances, but this setting really is most accurate to the color that his suit jacket actually was, which is kind of this like royal blue shade. Um, and so what I've just turned on right here is a before and after. So this is the original image straight out of camera on the left, and this is the one that I'm editing right now. And sometimes I do this to look back at the photo and make sure that the colors that I'm editing it to are fairly accurate to what originally happened on that day, and especially to preserve like that color of his suit jacket. Um, so we know that this first image was a little bit dark, so when things are brightened up, it really pretty much matches tone-wise. But if I were to turn the shadows up all the way, that's just like not really authentic to what his suit jacket really looked like. And I like to make sure that I preserve that as well. Whites and blacks are somewhat similar to highlights and shadows, except whites are going to be more intense and they're going to be specifically looking at the brightest of the bright highlights, and blacks are going to be looking at the darkest of the dark shadows. Um, so if I were to bring up the whites here, it's going to make her dress, as you can see, a lot brighter, but also focus on the wall too. Um, and the blacks is going to do something similar where it can make it darker 
or also bring up that tone somewhat too. Um, I, once again, typically don't mess with these too much because I like to keep those highlights just a little bit darker so that we can preserve the detail in them. And I also like my blocks to be just high enough that I can see the detail in these also because I don't want a suit jacket to turn into just straight darkness. I want to maintain like the color and the texture. Like there's some really interesting like fabric textures happening here that are really nice and I want to preserve that too. Okay, so once I have the exposure figured out, then I usually move up just a tiny bit and think about my white balance. And so white balance, um, right now we are just at the white balance that was applied as part of my preset. Um, but there are different settings that are automatically included in Lightroom itself. And these are pretty helpful if you're just starting out to learn white balance. Um, so if I decide to move to as shot, um, it's just the same that it was shot as. Um, my preset is just set to use what you start with as the white balance. I don't like presets that already change it for me. <laughs> um, so it's just set to do what it has been told to do effectively. Um, but there are options already for daylight, for cloudy situations, for fluorescent lighting, and that's just because you've probably noticed that lighting looks really different in all circumstances. Um, when you move to the shade, things are kind of a little bit bluer maybe than they are out in the bright sunlight. And when you're indoors, um, like fluorescent lighting or tungsten lighting or whatever other artificial lighting, it might look green, um, it might look orange. There's all kinds of different crazy variations of lighting. So if I went ahead and set this to daylight white balance, it's going to change this temperature, which is how cool tone or how warm tone the image is to 5,500. Um, the temperature I know of daylight bright sunlight is usually like 5,500 to 5,600 Kelvin. Um, that's what this number is, is the Kelvin scale. Um, and there's also a tint, which is how green or red tinted an image is. Um, and so if we start with daylight, you can move things a little bit pinker, a little bit greener, that's too much of course, um, just to really match like what tones you're looking for and also to make sure that that white balance is being preserved in a way that is authentic to the image. Um, I personally just like to figure it out myself. <laughs> um, I like trial and error a lot in white balance. Something that you can do is this eyedropper right here. Um, if there is a neutral tone in this image, like hypothetically if her dress was pure white, which it's not, it's a little bit cream, which makes a difference for white balance, um, you can choose this tone right here and it will pick this target neutral. And this means that it will assume that this tone in that photo is a perfect neutral. And so it will choose the ideal white balance so that that tone is perfectly neutral. Um, so if I choose this, there's not a huge difference, but you can see that this number in tint has been dragged down. So things are a little bit greener than they were before. And if I bring it back, it's a little bit redder. Um, so you can't tell as much in that circumstance in particular, but it does make a difference because her dress is cream tone. Like if I chose the gray wall, once again, we're getting like small differences. Um, and so sometimes this can be really helpful if you have the groom shirt is pure white, um, or if you know that his jacket is pure black, um, because white balancing off of that will help you figure out the ambient like lighting, white balance settings. I prefer my images to be a little bit on the warm side, so I am pretty much tweaking it regardless. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start with a white balance of 5700, which is up from 5450, which is where it was before. And I'm pretty happy with that. I like these warm skin tones. Um, I just think that warm images make me really happy. It feels like the weather is really nice all the time, which is funny because it's not. This elopement was in December <laughs> um, and it wasn't freezing, but it was still December in Indiana. Um, but I just think that warm photos look really happy. And that's really what I'm going for in the mood of my photos is that like, I think there's like warmth between couples and I really want to preserve that also. So it preserves that also. So regarding tint, how green or red tinted something is. Um, since we're outdoors, I don't really have to worry about trying to match this exactly for like the white balance itself, but I do consider it regarding skin tone. Um, so right now it's bumped up a little bit into the reddish purplish side for plus five, and their skin is pretty good right now. It's still maybe a little bit red tinted in some moments for my taste, so I might bring it back down to zero. And that difference is really, really subtle. <laughs> I know that it's something that's really small, but I've noticed that it makes just enough difference to matter for me. So this is where we started out at, and that is where we end up with. So if you look specifically like in areas like her nose and her cheeks, um, you can see the tint a little bit more, and that just helps get rid of any redness in skin, um, which I've found can be kind of distracting at times, especially when you're shooting and it's really cold because people's faces get red and cold, 
their cheeks get red in the cold, their ears get red in the cold, all that kind of stuff. And so I'm usually um, editing to make sure that I'm minimizing any of that like unflattering red in people's skin because I really like skin to look very smooth and even. All right, so moving on. Um, these next couple settings have to do a little bit with sharpness. Um, and so texture is something that it's not going to distort the sharpness of the image to where it looks like extra sharp and grainy, um, but it's going to give you a little bit of extra punch in some of those areas if you feel like you need it. So if you drag texture up all the way, as you can see, her hair looks a lot more defined. Um, I usually don't mess with texture um, just because I prefer a more natural look. And I also think that sometimes adding sharpness on skin can be kind of unflattering. So I prefer not to do that. Um, if I was going to add something like texture or sharpness, I would probably do that with the paintbrush tool, which we'll come back to at the end. Clarity is something similar, but stronger. And so it's adding less detail to your hair, but it's adding just more sharpness and darks and lights everywhere. That's also usually not something that I mess with too much. I like to have a little bit of clarity just to help with bumping sharpness up on some things right off the bat. Um, Dehaze is a setting that I'm not typically using, but it is really, really helpful if you are shooting a photo that has been really backlit um, or that has like had just the sun glare coming in, so things are kind of hazy. That's why it's called Dehaze. Um, and so what it does is really just up like the contrast in the perfect settings to bring out that image from the haziness, um, which is really unnecessary here, but it's useful in some settings too. Next for vibrance and saturation, these are both ways to make your image more colorful. I start with my saturation down a little bit because I tend to like some colors to be a little bit more muted and neutral. Vibrance is a really useful way to bring some bright color back into your image without um, destroying people's skin tones. So as you can see, if I bring up our vibrance here, all right, his suit is getting like a lot more bright blue, and this is getting a little bit more greenish too, which is interesting. Um, whereas if I drag up our saturation, their skin, they're just turning into Oompa Loompas really fast. <laughs> um, so those are similar in that they're going to add some more color, but Vibrance is going to preserve like the skin tones um, and things like that. So next, moving on to the tone curve. I typically don't mess with this um, unless I'm really, really doing some like heavy new preset work. Um, but I'll explain a little bit of what it does. So this is reminiscent of the histogram, as you can see. So the chart that is here looks really similar to the chart that is up here in the histogram. Um, so this is showing you that the areas in these highlights are lifted up a little bit. Our midtones, there's a lot of those, and there are some shadows and dark areas too. This is really just showing what you want the value of each of these areas to be. Um, so it also does similar things to these highlights, shadows, white, and black tones, once again. Um, but if I were to select this area, which as you can see is like around like the highlights a little bit, and I were to bring it down, you can see how those kind of mid-tones and highlights, because it selects this whole area, get brought down altogether. Whereas if I were to choose um, this area specifically at like the whitest of the whites, what's going to happen when it brings this down on this edge is that it's going to flatten out the color a little bit. So if I continue to bring it down further, you can see how it just flattens it out altogether. I'm like pointing at my computer screen right now, which is pretty useless. I'm sorry. Um, so it's just going to flatten out that tone so that all of the highlights, um, the brightest whites have like the same flat value. So there's less depth to them. Um, and if I were to bring this back up to the original, as you can see, there's a little bit even more depth in the highlights. I like to keep mine down somewhat. I like to keep the highlights um, muted a little bit because I think it makes them less distracting. It looks a little bit matte, a little bit flattering. I think it looks really nice and smooth and creamy. So that's why I choose to have um, this point on this tone curve be flattened out just a little bit. Um, as you can probably tell, the tone curve is really sensitive. So if I adjust this part over here on the shadows, like it does not take me moving things very much at all to make a big difference in the image. Um, and finally, the blackest of the blacks, I usually keep right down here in the corner. Sometimes, depending on the photo, I might bring them up, which, as you can see, has like an opposite effect to what the highlights did, where it's taking these black tones and flattening those out, too. Um, like I said, I don't typically mess with this too much, um, but I do think that like sometimes for black and whites, it can be extra fun to play with flattening out the shadows and the highlights just to give it an extra matte feel. Um, it's not my style to do that with um, all my other photos but it's definitely something that you can explore if you're interested in. 
I typically am looking at this tone curve just in this setting, but there's other ways that you can look at it too. So I can have it just show me the red tones. So if I'm really interested in only fine tweaking these red moments, which as you can see, make things a lot more red or a lot more green, um, you can also mess with those per red, green, and blue um, color settings as well. And instead of looking at this graph like these separate points that I can adjust, you can also look at things just as um, this curve itself, which is smooth. And it'll show you the range that you can adjust things to within each section. So like just for the highlights, um, or like just for the whites, just for the general exposure of the photo, and just for the shadows, it'll kind of give you a set range to work within um, without tweaking everything at the same time, which can be kind of useful too. So um, HSL sliders, these are some of my favorite tools in Lightroom. And I think that it took me a long time to understand them, um, but they are incredibly useful. So what we're looking at here is every color, red, orange, yellow, green, aqua, blue, purple, and magenta. These all have their own slider for each of these three settings. Hue is going to say like what the value of this color reads as. So if we're looking specifically at this yellow slider, if we drag it over, we can make all the yellow tones in the image more green, which there are not many of them in the image, so that was maybe a bad choice. But you can see it here in the background especially. It's going to become more green, or we can also say that, oh, our yellow tones should actually be more red make them a little bit more red. I'll show orange next since there are no, since I know there are more orange settings here. So we can have uh, Lightroom read our orange settings to be a lot more yellow, which just turn them into aliens, or we can have them be a lot more red, which is also really unflattering. So um, this is really helpful in fixing some of your skin tones, and it's also pretty powerful, where if they were still um, having like too much red in their skin, something that you can do is take this red slider and you can bump it up even further. And that means that anything red in the image is going to turn a little bit more orange, which is gonna help combat that, red, that redness in skin as well. Something else that I like to make sure that I do with these sliders is to make the green just a little bit more yellow, um, because I found that sometimes green grass, it's just so bright sometimes. And I like to have it more yellow toned because it really looks just a little bit more muted and like warm that way. And I think that that's really nice. So these are ways to tweak um, the individual colors within an image, as you can see, without changing his whole, um, without changing the picture as a whole, we can make his suit green, which actually looks pretty nice. A green suit would be pretty cool. Someone do that. Um, or it could be purple. Let's see, pretty fun. Um, and so the hue section is just changing the color to one of the colors around it. You can tweak things that way. The saturation section is just going to look specifically at how saturated, if you remember, that's like how bright and colorful the colors are um, from earlier for each individual color. Um, typically, I am not messing with these first colors, but if I really wanted to make his suit even brighter, I could pull up our blue saturation and you see it getting real, real, real blue. <laughs> if I wanted to make it just gray, I couldn't do it, but that wouldn't be authentic to his suit color, so I'm not going to do that. Um, you can also do this if sometimes there are certain situations where skin is like extra orange and that's really bothersome. So you might decide to bring the saturation of your orange tones down just to mute that out just a little bit. And that's not going to affect the picture as a whole. It's only going to affect the places that are orange, which is really neat. Um, you can also make skin a little bit more orange if you choose to do so. So everyone looks like they have a really nice spray tan. Um, but my style is to keep things pretty natural on that end. And luminance. A little bit different than the previous two so this is going to take each one of these individual colors and say how dark or light they are um, so let's look specifically at his suit if I bring up the luminance of the blue which means I'm making all of the blue brighter you can see it makes a little bit of difference in what I can see of his suit um, in the darkness here you can also bring it down and just have the blue be really really dark this can be useful too if you're trying to brighten up people's faces sometimes um, skin typically reads as orange um, or sometimes red too, just depending on what someone's skin tone is. But this can also be a great way to brighten up faces I've found. So sometimes I will just take the orange luminance and like bring it up just to bring out the brightness in their faces a little bit, which I don't need to do in this photo, but that is a time that this can be really useful. So I really think that I started to figure out how to use these sliders um, when I was really trying to like maintain these consistent skin tones. Um, and I found that that is a really helpful usage of them. So there's another view that you can set these to. I go ahead and show mine just to have all of them shown at once because I'm typically looking at all of them, but you can have it just show you the hue or just the saturation sliders or just the luminance 
Um, I believe that there is a way that you can see like just the orange for hue, saturation, and luminance, but I right now am, oh yeah, it's color. I couldn't remember where it was, sorry. There's so many settings here. I can never remember where exactly to find them all, just that they exist. This is exactly the settings that I already have adjusted. It's just a different way of viewing them, which obviously I don't typically use. So if you're only interested in modifying the orange sliders, you can do so from this panel. Once again, you can mess with the saturation here, make their skin more yellow, do whatever you want. It's exactly the same settings, it just looks different. Um, and something else that you can do if you're really struggling to select a specific tone, um, especially for skin tones or sometimes for dresses too. Um, sometimes I have like a bridesmaid's dress that might have turned more like purple instead of blue when I import the photo and put it on the preset and I don't want it to look like that and I'm having a really hard time finding that exact color like it's not changing enough for blue it's not changing enough for purple like I can't figure out exactly where that color is falling on Lightroom's color spectrum um, what you can do is use this little tool over here and it's going to select a specific tone that you click on to be the tone that you adjust if that makes sense um, so let's say that I'm really interested in adjusting her fingernail color. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and click here and it's going to show me that it's highlighting that red section as you can see. So it's reading it as red and as I drag up, which you can't see, it's going to make it more orange. And as I drag down, it's going to make it like more magenta. And because the red and the orange are really close together, it's really reading her nails as both red and orange a little bit. So that means it's going to adjust both the red and orange sliders in adjusting this color that you specifically chose. Um, so I probably wouldn't want to do that because it's also going to adjust her skin, but that's something that is really useful if you're trying to pin down a very specific color. Um, perhaps for his suit jacket, I'm really interested in making it um, just a little bit more like purple tinted. I can click and once again, as I drag, it's mostly only changing the blue slider, but as you can see, it's changing the purple slider just a teeny tiny bit too. Um, so as you choose a very specific tone, it'll adjust the sliders that need to be adjusted to match the color um, that you have chosen, which is really nice. Lightroom is so smart sometimes, I swear. All right, so split toning. Um, this is going to reference the tint that the highlights of your photo have and the tint that the shadows have. Um, so I've mentioned Picnic already once, but I'm gonna do it again. So Picnic is really how I learned to edit photos when I was in like high school. And there was a preset called, or not a preset, I don't remember what they were called, but it wasn't presets. Um, I'm just really used to speaking in the language of Lightroom now. Um, that was called split toning. And I think that you could change the color so things would look like blue in the shadows and then yellow in the highlights. And I like thought it was so cool. I have some really obnoxiously edited photos that I should share. Um, like one of the first photos I edited that I was really excited about was a picture of my horse and I had made her bright pink and I made the background bright green. Um, so we, we do not all start knowing how to do this. Um, it takes a lot of hard work, but split toning, I was very enthusiastic about in a uh, picnic many years ago. And I like to keep my highlights and shadows a little bit on the neutral side now. So as you can see the saturation of the specific color tint that each of these have, it's pretty low. So it's not going to have much of a tint at all. My highlights are a little bit reddish orangish um, and as you can see if I were to bring up the saturation it's making these highlights be even more reddish orangish tinted as you can see it's kind of like a burnt color um, but I like to keep it pretty low because I like to have those highlights be a little bit warm and have that warm tint um, but I'm not trying to make it like be really color I'm not trying to look like it was taken through one giant color filter um, and same thing goes for shadows um, this one is a little bit more yellowish tinted um, possibly umber if that's what that color is called. Um, but once again, I like to keep that fairly neutral. So you can make some adjustments to these. Um, sometimes I might decide to make my highlights a little bit more yellow tinted to help preserve those skin tones again. It's going to make a really small difference, um, as you can see here, but just a little bit. Um, and the shadows, exact same deal. So the tint that you use um, with this split toning will have like a little bit of a different uh, uh, an impact on the tone of the photo as a whole but I like to stick with these warm colors because once again I like warm toned images that are like true to life and are not going to really drastically change um, like the tones and the coloration that I saw in the first place. Moving on to detail here um, this is showing a really close-up of the photo which I believe is directly from the center of the image which is probably like around here so it's funny because it looks 
just plain white and that is her dress and I'm lost in it. <laughs> um, I swear that's what it is though. Um, so these settings underneath, um, this is where you can sharpen things. I typically have the sharpening up just a little bit because I like to really preserve the detail and the sharpness um, in the photo, of course. Um, and you can also have your sharpness setting. You can change the detail and the radius and the masking to sort of adjust how it sharpens things. I usually don't mess with these either, but it will change um, how large of an area like the sharpness itself is impacting. So like when I change this radius, you can see that it's sharpening more of her hair than it really was before. Um, and if I change the detail setting, it's also going to pick up on a little bit more detail to like preserve in the image. Um, so I'm pretty happy with like the default setting of these and the masking is making things just a little bit less sharp actually, which is interesting. So these all are working in tandem to like preserve certain details, to not sharpen certain details, to sharpen more details. Um, typically I don't like to mess with them that much because I like photos to be pretty sharp in the first place. Um, and that's just not something that I prefer to mess with in post. There's really no way to sharpen a photo that is a little bit fuzzy to begin with. Um, okay, so regarding the next section here, noise reduction is going to be removing grain from the photo. And in this default preset, I typically have a little bit of noise reduction on. And luminance here is minimizing any of that noise, which I know is a little bit confusing because it's the same term as this luminance in which you're making things brighter. This is not actually, oops, sorry, I scrolled past it. This is not actually making anything brighter. It's just making things less grainy. I can't tell you why they're called the same thing. Someone else might know that answer. I just know that they are um, doing very different things. So this noise reduction has similar settings too. Um, so if when I remove the noise, it's also getting rid of some detail in the photo, I can tell it, hey, no, keep all the detail or um, keep a lot of contrast in that um, noise that you're reducing as well. So there's different ways to tweak that. I usually just have it on just a little bit to combat any noisiness um, that might occur when I bring up the exposure of a photo from where it began. And finally, this also has to do with the noise settings. Since there isn't noise in this photo, you're really not going to see much, but it's going to once again allow you to specify like how detailed you want the noise removal process to be in terms of like um, getting all of the color noise or exactly what. Um, so next, moving on to lens corrections. This is a really important setting that I'm using for pretty much all of my photos. I have this preset um, set to not apply a lens correction, and that is just because I shoot with a lot of different lenses at each shoot. Um, and so if I have like photos with five different lenses that I import and I put the same preset on all of them, you can only save a certain preset's defaults um, or a certain lenses defaults to a preset. So I could only save this preset with my 35 millimeter lens corrections, which are not going to be accurate for my 50 millimeter or my 85 or my 100 or my 70 to 200 or anything else. So I start out with no lens corrections. That way I can just apply it for each individual lens and not have to worry about it um, distorting things in a way that is not accurate for each individual lens. So I go ahead and just turn on profile corrections, which is real easy, just a click of a button. Um, and what it's doing is it's reading the data from this photo to know that I shot this with a 50 millimeter lens and it knows exactly what it needs to fix to get rid of any distortion. All lenses are going to shoot with a little bit of distortion because they are round and because the, and the glass on the uh, front element of the lens is rounded. That's just how they work. There's always going to be a little bit of distortion. It's less noticeable with longer lenses like the 85 or the 70 to 200. Um, there's really not even much distortion with the 50 I feel like. but. There can be a lot of distortion with really wide angle lenses. Um, so like I have a 14 millimeter lens, which is a very, very wide angle lens. And that brings in echo distortion every single time I shoot with it. Um, and sometimes I don't even fix it because sometimes the fixing process is so like heavily tweaking the image that it actually almost just looks better if I just leave it how it is. Um, but that's very dependent on what is in the photo and how many straight lines there are. <laughs> So I, but I generally am applying um, these profile corrections to 99% of every photo that I take. I like that it corrects the distortion just a little bit. Um, and I also like that it's gonna remove the heavy vignetting that you see in the corners of this right now. Um, typically what I'm doing is I'm going to go ahead and bring back a little bit of this vignetting. So even though it's really well set, I just noticed that there's like 
It's just a little bit bright down here that looks like it was exposed just a little bit too much for my taste. I'm going to bring things down just a bit because um, I like to keep some of that darkness at the edge. I don't want things to look unnatural. I still want it to look really like flat and normal. Um, so that is how I choose to do things too. Chromatic aberration is when um, along edges of something that is very high contrast, you won't see it in this photo, um, but sometimes you see it especially with like tree branches against the sky. Um, there's like some purple and green like fringing around the edges and that is what chromatic aberration is and this is also a checkbox that you can tell Lightroom, hey just remove this for me and it just will. Um, you can change a different lens profile so if I would like to actually apply the lens corrections for a 35 millimeter to this instead, I can. As you can see it doesn't look hugely different um, but some of them are really going to. So if I were to come back to this 14 millimeter that I was talking about it's going to do a lot more vignetting, fixing, a lot more distortion tweaking than it would for the 50 millimeter that I have. And it just has those profiles saved for everything. It's just gonna read your lens, make your life super easy. If you decide to, however, you can correct things manually as well. If I would like things to be way, well, way more distorted or way less distorted, um, you could do so. You could then crop out the edges if you decide that's what you want, but there's really no reason to. Um, Defringing helps with chromatic aberration too, so if you notice that there are more purple tones than it's getting, um, so even when you turn on remove chromatic aberration it's still missing some, you can have it um, get rid of more purple tones and get rid of more green tones to fix that as well. So it really lets you fine tweak every single setting. And these hues in between, when you're looking at this purple defringing you can tell it to include more reddish tints too if it's still not getting them, um, and it will just help you remove all of those. I haven't found any chromatic aberration that I couldn't fix with these little sliders in Lightroom, which is great. And you can also come back to the vignetting here as well. So that is that section. We are kind of getting grooving here. Um, next are the transform adjustments. These are also something not typically that I'm messing with on a, usual, a regular basis, but if you remember I mentioned before with the 14 millimeter how it's important to make sure that like if there are straight lines that you're keeping those lines straight basically. This is a really useful way to do that. Um, so sometimes if I've noticed that there is like a little bit of distortion or if um, things are angled so they're not perfectly dead on um, and I really want my lines to be perfectly horizontal, perfectly vertical, angled just right on, you can go ahead and choose auto which is going to like not do anything in this instance because there is no perspective to be found. It doesn't have any of those lines to balance something from um, but this will let you um, this will, first of all, either automatically do it for you or allow you to change the angle of things just a little bit um, or change things just so she's freaked out a little bit more or he is too. So this can be really helpful if you're shooting from far away and if you're trying to keep like a, a horizon like perfectly even um, and it's like down a little bit on one side, this lets you really tweak things to fit those like perfect lines, which is very cool. Um, effects here. I am not really doing anything with this panel much, um, but this is post-crop vignetting. So if you remember before, this is the vignetting that's associated with the lens correction, um, but there's a way that you can also just add vignette. So after you've cropped the image, it's going to keep things at those same dimensions and it'll add any vignette for you. Sometimes I do add a little bit of vignette because I like to make sure that the people are popping. In this instance, I um, probably am not going to. I think it looks just fine. But once you have a little bit of a vignette applied, you can change the midpoint of it, which means you can just change how far in or out the vignette itself is going. You can change the shape of it if you want it to be more square or more round the other way. And how feathered it is too, so if it's going to fade a lot more or be really sharp. <laughs> um, you can also change how it preserves the highlights on the outside of the vignette, which I don't have enough applied to really like show you exactly what that change will look like and there aren't sharp enough highlights here to really see them either um but this is just a way to add some of that and preserve the same crop that you had as well because the lens correction is only going to fix the like original dimensions and the original edges of the photo as shot so if you've significantly cropped it this will help you make sure that you're uh, that you're keeping that um, vignette on all four sides and all four corners this is also the panel where you can add green to the photo which is a very cool like film look um, and so if I add a lot of green, you can see what that looks like. There's more texture here on her face and in her dress and in the wall as well. I'm typically not adding green. I feel like I spend most of my life battling green. Like I'm trying to like 
minimized grain in my photos and trying to keep grain away when I'm shooting in the darkness. So I never want to intentionally add it. But I always think it's other it's really cool when other people do it. I always think it looks nice. I just never want to do it on my own photos. But you can adjust the size of those actual grain particles if you want them to be a lot bigger, um, which also impacts how clear your photo is, by the way, um, or a lot tinier, which is letting you preserve more detail. You can also preserve, um, if you want them to be really sharp, like sandpaper looking, or much like smoother looking grain, which you can barely see at all. I, like I said, typically just don't add grain. That's my preference. Um, if I'm using a preset that includes it, I usually just remove it. Um, Typically, any grain that the photo automatically has is more than enough for me, and I'm fine with that. This final panel um, for calibration is also not something that I typically mess with, but this is adjusting how Lightroom reads the colors that your camera has shot in the first place. Um, so this means that it's going to read the red tints as a little bit more orange, it's going to read the green tints as a little more aqua, and the blue tints a little bit back more toward aqua too. Um, and this is something that you can adjust I typically don't. It does some similar things to the HSL sliders, and I'm typically just adjusting things from there, um, so I don't really change the process calibration at all. And to be honest, I'm not an expert on that panel. I just kind of uh, let it do what it does and let it read my camera how it plans to read my camera, and I'm perfectly happy with that. So now that I've gone through all of these settings here in the right-hand panel, I'm going to talk about these up here in the bar at the top. These are usually the last things that I do, which is why I'm talking about them last. Once I have things really exposed and colored how I want them, then I move up here. Um, so this is our crop tool. This is really helpful. I really like that it has um, these lines, first of all, for rule of thirds. I'm like a big stickler for rule of thirds. Like, you don't have to be. You can do whatever you want. But I like for things to be pretty balanced in terms of like space on both sides of the photo, so I don't like anyone to be too close to the edge of the frame. That's just a personal preference. Um, so what I'm noticing here is that there is this line in the background, which I believe is some kind of guttering. As you can see, that's at a little bit of an angle compared to this perfectly vertical line of the crop tool. So I am going to turn things just a little bit so that they are perfectly straight then up and down. I cannot shoot a straight photo to save my life. Um, I don't think any of us can. Every photo that I shoot is crooked, so um, you might have to get really, really used to um, <laughs> straightening crooked photos if you're anything like me. I also see that there's this little dark thing here, which I'm actually not sure what it is on the wall. It looks like a pipe. I find it a little bit distracting, as you can see in this image too. So I'm just going to go ahead and like drop that out because I don't really like it. And then I don't want him to be too close to the edge of the frame. So I'm going to pull them back over just so things are fixed really nicely like that. Um, that is just how I really prefer to do my cropping. So we started out here and then I straighten things a bit, brought it in a little bit tighter and then move things over because I didn't want him to be too much in the corner of the frame. I thought that that was a little bit distracting, and so now our focal point just really comes right under her face, which is nice. Another way to use this crop tool here is there is this little bit ruler, and you can use this to draw a straight line, and it will go ahead and tilt the photo for you to match that straight line. So if I draw this, it's going to go ahead and fix that for me. Um, and that's really useful for horizon lines. I don't have a horizon line here to work with, but if you have like a line from water or a field and you're noticing it's going like this, you can use the ruler to to draw a line along that and it'll just poop, pop it right into a straight line for you, which is very cool. Lightroom is, like I said, kind of magical. Um, when I'm cropping things, I always maintain the original aspect ratio um, as shot. That's just how I keep things. I don't crop my photos to be like any more skinnier or shorter than that. I just prefer that they are all exactly the same aspect ratio. And I know that, that gets a little bit complicated because when you're printing photos, like 4x6 and 5x7 and 8x10, those are all different aspect ratios. Um, so I don't know who like designed picture frames in the first place, or frankly who designed the cameras to be, I don't know. I'm, I'm the 35mm camera definitely like came first, um, but I just don't know why they are all not exactly the same aspect ratio. So anytime someone is printing something, it's going to get cropped a little bit, whether it's this side or that side. It's just how it is. But I prefer then to keep that original um, aspect ratio. That way when they do print things, there's like a little bit of space if for some reason they have to cut off an edge. It's just it's just a thing we have to live with that is a little bit obnoxious, and it's fine. So these other tools. This is the um, clone stamp tool, which is very cool. 
Um, and this is really helpful for getting rid of annoying things in the background. So as you see, I have this little circle and I just scroll up and down to make it bigger or smaller. Um, and let's say that I would really like to remove this weird little thing right here. So I can make this brush pretty small so it fits just right over top of this. I click and it's going to go ahead and fill this with something that like matches the surrounding area. So in our case, it chose something from down here to actually like fill that thing with, which is a lot less annoying than it was before. I would like to preserve that line between the images, so I'm actually going to have it choose from this point right here instead. Um, but as you can see, that really just gets rid of distracting things in the background. You can use it for larger things too, um, if there are people in the back or if there's like a random duck that's weird. Um, there's one venue, not a venue, I'm sorry, a location that I do a lot of engagement pictures out around here that has buoys in the water and I always Photoshop out the buoys because I think they're kind of annoying looking. So. It's a fun way to get little annoying things out of the background. Um, this is where we were at before, and this is where we're at now. And that's a really small thing. I probably wouldn't fix that on a regular photo. Um, two, real quick, one other thing to add about this clone stamp tool is you can change exactly how it's handling things. So heal means it's going to look at what you've chosen it to look at and make it match the surrounding area of the thing that you're covering up, which is helpful. If you do the clone stamp, however, it's going to exactly copy whatever is right here. And it doesn't make that much of a difference because this looks really similar to the original. But if I were to come down here and copy her eye, as you can see, it's exactly pasting what is inside this circle right up here. It's pretty weird. But if we are healing, it's trying to take what I've told it to look at and make it match the surrounding area, which it hasn't done an awesome job of, but it's tried to match the color. Um, so that can be useful, especially when you're looking at like trees and you're trying to match things to the original. Um, heel can be really useful if you won't, don't want it to look exactly repeated. Um, so that is, I use that tool a lot to really get rid of things in the background here. Um, the red eye tool, this is for flash if people have um, like those really creepy red dots in their eyes. You can use that to like select their um, pupil and just get rid of it. And of course it can't find red eye because there is none here. Um, next, a couple last things to look at here. This is the one of the mask tools that Lightroom offers. This is specifically the, I believe it's a linear mask called graduated filter. Okay, well it's also a linear mask because it is a line and it is a mask. Um, so this means that I'm gonna go ahead and turn on this show selected mask overlay filter so you can see what it does. Um, so it's going to, show us that I have now um, selected this specific area of the photo. So anything that is red tinted just like this, it's going to show me what I have selected. It's not really making it red, it's just being like, it's like your masking tape, I guess. <laughs> not quite accurate. Um, but it's just showing you, hey, here's the areas that you are adjusting. So then if I decide that I want this top portion of my photo to be a lot lighter and I drag it lighter, it's only going to affect this area that you have selected, which is very cool. And there's lots of different settings in here for just highlights or exposure. You can make just the top of the photo warmer. Um, you can make just the top of the photo sharper and things like that. So it is really helpful for that. Um, sometimes I do this for photos outside if I really want to bring out the sun flare and I'll make things a little bit warmer, maybe a little bit brighter above them just to really enhance that um, sensation of the sun there. And next is a radial filter. This does exactly the same thing as the um, last mask that I was looking at here, except this one is a circle. So it's only going to do things to the outside of the circle. Um, and you can also have it switch so that it is inverted and that it's only adjusting the inside of the circle instead. I typically use the radial uh, filter or the radial mask like this just to adjust like the inside of the circle it's a fun way to really like bring out the warmth which is not working on this photo but if you have like a sun flare in the corner it can kind of like bring that out in a really nice way and help enhance the sun i really am all about warmth and sun i swear you're probably going to be hearing me say that um and finally the paintbrush tool my best friends this has like all of the same settings that the previous two have had but it's all in this little brush tool and so i'm gonna go ahead and select the mask over it if I'm really interested in taking this wall and making it blue, I can just click and scribble all over this whole section. I'm going to go ahead and hide my mask overlay so I can see what I'm doing then. Um, 
and I can go ahead and, sorry, I had to adjust that. It's, it's default set to make things a little bit brighter when I click on each tool, and I just wanted to undo that. So I'm only adjusting this area that I have highlighted now, so I can go ahead and bring the temperature down. I can make it blue, and then I can bring my saturation up and make it really bright blue. Um, so you can do some really funky things with this brush, which is really fun to play with. Um, what I'm typically using this brush for, however, is to use an effect called Skin Soften. Um, so these are all of the default ones that Lightroom includes, which is just to make things a little bit brighter, more contrast. It has some things set up for you, but you can also just do them all yourself. Um, these brushes are not anything that you can't already just adjust the settings to. It's just presets to save your time a little bit. I have this Skin Soften brush. I wish I could tell you where it came from because I can't for the life of me remember. I want to say maybe Cole's Classroom, but I am not sure. Regardless, <laughs> um, Skin Soften here is going to turn the contrast down, the clarity down, but it's going to bring up the sharpness and the noise just a tiny bit, and that's going to smooth out people's skin while also keeping them from looking like a plastic Barbie. It's really wonderful. I absolutely love it. Um, I believe that I've turned down the strength of this from the original, because I prefer for it to be a little bit uh, more mild. And so what I'm typically doing is making this brush nice and small, and then going over certain areas on the face here. It's important to not go over lines, um, like in the eyes or actually over the nose itself, because that will just like ruin some of that like default line and that will make people look more plasticky. Um, but I like to just smooth out a little bit of skin. I'm usually only doing it on ladies. Sorry guys. Um, if you have like acne or something, I will like get rid of that. But typically I'm just doing it to smooth out ladies skin. Um, and also to get like these bags out from under eyes. And I think that's just because that's something I'm personally really self-conscious about. I feel like I always have bags under my eyes. So I'm just like, oh no, fix your bags for her or something. Um, but I don't do major retouching. Like I'm not going to like make someone's nose look different or not going to like Photoshop out um, necessarily like a mole or a birthmark. I really like people to keep exactly the way they are. She has these really cute like squinting laugh lines. It's adorable. Um, and I just like to make sure that like skin still looks nice and smooth. Um, something that's really interesting is these cameras, um, especially the newer ones, have such high resolution that you can see like every pore. <laughs> Sometimes I take self-portraits and I'm like, whoa, my skin actually looks like that because it's so high resolution. So you really have to like smooth things out to make it look more natural even just because the cameras are incredibly sharp. Um, so something else that you can do with this, with this brush feature here is once you have applied one of these um, effects that you want to apply, you can close this drop down menu. And as you can see, this changes all of these settings into one thing called amount. So it's going to keep the same ratios between all of the settings, but I can make her skin like a lot smoother. I can make it not do anything at all or bring it back. So that's just going to let you like kind of change the sensitivity of what you are um, using here and just like really adjust all of that as a whole instead of changing each setting one at a time, if that makes sense. Um, so then we're going to go ahead and hit done to save what we did with the brush there. And that is about it. That is typically all of the editing that I'm doing on each photo and I hope I explained what each of these settings is and why I have chosen them to be set the way I have pretty well here. I like to look back at the original photo too once I've finished to see like how it compares um, and it's always really nice to see there. So if that was fun, um, go ahead and ask me any questions in the comments and I'll try to help out with those in the best way that I can. Typically when I'm like finished editing a photo, I like to go ahead and go into lights out mode, which um, the hotkey for that is just to hit L once and then twice. And that just makes your screen totally black and you can just see this image with no distractions. So oftentimes when I'm finished with a gallery, I'll just scroll through all the photos like this just on the black background to make it a little bit easier to look at and see where we are at. Um, like I said, ask me any questions and I am happy to help. I have more editing videos forthcoming in the future too.